in this lecture and for the remaining part of this course, we will discuss uh, some issues related to uh, development of nonlinear finite element models. So, we will begin in today's lecture a brief introduction of the what are the main issues and we will start reviewing uh, principles of uh, continuum mechanics as much as is needed for purpose of illustrating uh, the model development. So, first we can ask ourselves the question what are nonlinear systems? So, a simple answer would be to uh, begin by defining what is linear system and a negation of uh, uh, that definition would tell us what is nonlinear system. So, if you have a, a system with input x1 producing uh, output y1 and x2 of t producing output y2 of t. If you were to apply x1 and x2 together, the response would be sum of y1 and y2 and this is known as additivity property. Similarly, if we apply an input which is a scalar multiple a of x1 of t, the response will be a of y1 of t. So, if these two properties are satisfied, we say that the system is linear. A nonlinear system is a system that is not linear. So, these one of these conditions would not be satisfied. So, this is a non-specific description. It does not tell you what exactly is the nature of nonlinearity, it simply tells that linear property is not obeyed. Now, some simple examples suppose if you consider a system whose input is x and output is y, and they are related through this equation y equal to mx plus c, it is a scalar equation. So, if x1 is the input, y let y1 be the output. Now, if I multiply the input by a by a factor a, we say that we see that this is not equal to uh, the principle of superposition is not valid here. Suppose y1 is response to ax1 and if we consider the response a y which it is not equal to y1. So, the, the system is not linear since it does not obey the scaling property. Uh, so, a lesson from this is that 0 input produces 0 output in a linear system. So, this is not satisfied in this case. Now, to fix the idea we can consider a simple uh, a single degree linear uh, vibrating system uh, with input x of t and output y of t. So, let, let us assume that system starts from rest. Suppose y1 is a response to x1 and y2 is a response to x2. If we now uh, add these two equations, we will see that uh, the output gets added up x1 plus x2. So, by inspection we see that y1 plus y2 is a solution of this equation. Therefore, principle of super, uh, first condition is satisfied. Similarly, if I multiply this equation uh, input by a, uh, we, see, we can again by inspection we see that uh, a y 1 is a solution. So, this system is linear. Now, if you now include a, a cubic nonlinear term alpha y cube, um, let x for under x 1 let y 1 be the response and under x 2 let y 2 be the response. Let us assume for the um, purpose of illustration that we have 0 initial conditions. Now, again as before if I add the inputs I mean add these two equations I see that um, I get this equation. Whereas, if I now apply an excitation x, uh, x 2 plus x 3 that is x 1 plus x 2 the response if a response is denoted by y 3 we see that y 3 is not equal to y 1 plus y 2 therefore, system is nonlinear. Now, we can examine as an exercise you can examine the two examples that is a single degree linear system and single degree nonlinear system by including the effect of non-zero initial condition. So, you can see what happens. Another system uh, x of t is the input and y of t is the output. So, if I now uh, supply an input which is a scalar multiple of x of t say a of x of t, we see that y of 1 of t will be a of y of t. That means, scaling property is satisfied but additivity property is not satisfied. Therefore, the system is still non-linear, it is not linear although one of the properties is satisfied. Now, we can uh, start discussing about what is the implication of system being non-linear on response analysis. So, response to all the relevant loads need to be analyzed uh, uh, simultaneously. So, you cannot uh, analyze response to individual loads and uh, superpose the uh, response because principle of superposition is not valid. Now, I will illustrate with some simple uh, cases, but I will just uh, enunciate some of the properties. Undamped in undamped free vibration, frequency of oscillations depend on initial conditions, which is again an unusual feature if you are thinking this property for linear systems. Then harmonic inputs at frequency omega can produce harmonic response responses at 
uh, frequency is not equal to omega. It can produce non-harmonic responses and it can also produce aperiodic responses. So we can think of uh, primary, subharmonic, and superharmonic resonances. In a, whereas in a linear single degree freedom system, there is one natural frequency and one resonant frequency. Whereas for a, a single degree freedom non-linear system, under a single frequency excitation, there can be several resonances. Then reciprocity relations, which are uh, one of the major features of linear system, uh, are not valid for non-linear system. So this property helps us to verify in a laboratory, for example, if a system is behaving linearly or not. Then, so large responses can occur at frequencies other than the driving frequency. This again refers to the, uh, the subharmonic and superharmonic resonances that I mentioned. Then steady state responses depend on initial conditions, whereas in a linear uh, systems uh, under harmonic excitations, uh, steady state when they exist they are independent of initial conditions, whereas this is not true here. Then there can be multiplicity of steady state solutions for nonlinear system. If you simply consider an algebraic quadratic equation ax square plus bx plus c equal to 0, even for such simple algebraic equation we already know there are two solutions. So uh, if it is a differential equation with uh, nonlinear terms one can still expect uh, that there will be multiplicity of solutions that indeed happens. Uh, then system can possess multiple equilibrium states and display a wide range of bifurcations. This we have discussed when we talked about stability problems. Then concept of normal modes, natural frequencies and natural coordinates are no longer applicable for nonlinear systems. So you cannot uncouple the equations of motion through a transformation. Then band limited excitation can produce responses with frequency content outside the bandwidth of excitation. Uh, so this again is a uh, uh, very important uh, aspect of nonlinear system behavior both in response analysis as well as in experimental work. So in fact a, a narrow band for example a single frequency harmonic excitation can produce a very broad band response and that type of behavior is, uh, is known as chaos. Uh, we will not be touching upon that I am just mentioning uh, for sake of uh, completeness. Now some simple uh, analytical solutions. Um, to illustrate some of the features, this is not an exhaustive coverage, but just to motivate you to special features that you should expect when you are dealing with nonlinear problems. Suppose we consider an undamped uh, single degree freedom system with cubic nonlinear terms, and it starts with an initial condition a x of zero is a, and where initial velocity is zero. Mu is a parameter. If mu is zero, system is linear. So we can see that solution is a cos omega n t, but omega n is this frequency. Now, if mu is not 0, one can expect that the frequency of oscillation and the nature of oscillations would change. It need not be at omega n, it will be influenced by mu. So what I will do is I will represent the solution in a series x0 of t plus mu x1 plus mu square x2 plus so on and so forth. Then omega square which is the frequency of oscillation I will again expand in a similar series. Now the unknowns here are uh, x0 and omega n are known x1, x2, alpha1, alpha2 uh, they are not known. What we do is we substitute this assumed solution into this form uh, into the given equation and then collect terms um, uh, you know on both sides uh, uh, which are powers of mu. So if you collect terms on mu to the power of 0 I get this equation, mu to the power of 1 I get this equation. Now if we can examine these solutions, solution to these equations. So if we consider the first equation it is x0 double dot plus omega square x0 equal to 0 from which we get x0 of t is a cos omega t. Now x1 the equation for x1 has x0 of t on the right hand side or here it is present here. So if we now take that into account and solve the next level of equation which is again linear these all these equation for x0, x1 etc. will be linear but solution at the previous step drives the solution at the next step. So if we solve this problem we get uh, x1 of t to be given by uh, something uh, like this. Now uh, if that means I have expanded cos cube omega t I am writing the right hand side. Now if we examine this uh, equation if um, this omega and this omega are the same. So as uh, time becomes large the solutions will become unbounded uh, because we are in a resonant kind of situation. But system is 
undamped it is conservative therefore uh, this type of solutions are not possible. So we demand that this multiplicating term uh, alpha 1 minus 3 4 the square must be 0 for uh, simulating the expected qualitative behavior of the system. So uh, we get alpha 1 to be uh, 3 4 of a square. So from based on this I can construct this solution and using the initial conditions I will be able to write this solution for x1 of t. So if we restrict our solution analysis to only the first two terms I get x of t as a cos omega t plus mu a cube by 32 omega square this cos 3 omega t minus cos omega t. Omega curiously is given by this. This omega depends on a. What is a? a is the initial condition. So this is what I was telling the frequency of free vibration can depend on initial conditions and the response here is periodic uh, but it is not harmonic okay. So uh, period depends on initial condition where if mu is greater than 0 omega will be greater than omega naught uh, we call that a hardening behavior and mu is less than 0 we call softening behavior. Now we can of course include higher order terms and do this the objective of this discussion is not to illustrate the solution method but to highlight the qualitative feature of the response. Now a similar system under harmonic excitation hmm, it is damped uh, non-linear system under harmonic excitation. If mu is 0 uh, we know that response uh, is harmonic uh, uh, for large times uh, that is a harmonic steady state. Now we want to examine what should be the solution. So if mu is 0 I have x0 of t is a cos omega t. Now I will assume that for some a and omega this could, for some a this could be the solution. So I will substitute uh, this assumed solution into the equation of motion this is only solution in the steady state. So uh, I will collect terms containing sin cosine terms do a what is known as harmonic balance and I get a pair of equations uh, which are given by this. Now <coughs> this resulting equation is the frequency response function of the system. So this is a forcing function f amplitude omega n is a natural frequency omega is a driving frequency a is the amplitude of response. In linear systems this on the right hand side we will not get this a cube term okay. So now if I plot this frequency response function uh, we start getting curves like this. in a linear system we know that uh, the typically this curve will uh, look like this. Now in a non-linear system uh, things change in certain bandwidth of excitation frequencies there are three possible routes and uh, which one is actually realized in a solution depends on initial conditions and all three solutions need not be stable okay. So now the question is we have to examine stability of these multiple steady state solutions and uh, only those solutions which are stable will be realized. Now if you were to uh, do a thought experiment where you are increasing the driving frequency and you are, you are starting with initial conditions which are on the this branch. So as you progress along this line when you come here the response suddenly uh, drops. This is steady state response this you would not see in the time history of a response it is two different time histories but with initial conditions in the neighborhood of this response. So it drops and it will follow this path. So this branch will not be realized in such a calculation but on the other hand if you start with this, this side of the solution and you progress this way uh, keeping initial conditions in the neighborhood of the steady state solutions here uh, then you will see that you will move along this path and there will be an upward jump and it will be like. So if you are if you ignore no, uh, presence of non-linearity you may think that this is the resonant amplitude frequency whereas it will be this and that can lead to a conservative estimate of the response. Now how do we see in the regions where there are multiple solutions or even elsewhere how do you know that the solutions are realizable. So what we can do we did this stability analysis earlier uh, what we will do is we will perturb the assumed solution by a small perturbation substitute back into this and uh, we, uh, we get now a time varying system where the assumed periodic solution appears as a coefficient. So for a given value of a from this graph for a given pair of values of omega and a you come here and do a flow case analysis and find out whether the perturbations grows in time or not. So that establishes whether the assumed solution is stable or not. <coughs> so the, if there are multiple steady state solutions possible 
then which one will be realized is a question that you have to uh, answer and in fact it turns out that in regions where there are multiple steady state solutions uh, the uh, responses will be dependent on initial conditions. So this again is a newer feature. Now there is another way of uh, looking at this problem I will quickly run through this. Uh, we again consider a similar system, a system with cubic nonlinearity and uh, I will seek the solution in the neighborhood of capital omega being uh, in the neighborhood of omega naught. So what we do is I perturb omega naught by a small parameter known as detuning. Okay, this is called as detuning. Epsilon is a small parameter. Now uh, I will arrange the amplitude of excitations and damping uh, in this manner, and this method is known as method of multiple scales. The discussion on this is not focused on how to implement the method, but what the method tells us if you do it. So I will skip this uh, uh, the details of this uh, implementation of this solution, but what I will show is in this method I get solution in the form a of t cos omega naught t plus beta of t where a and b are slowly varying functions of time which are governed by these two differential equations a and beta. Okay. Now uh, I can rewrite this equation in this form and if a steady state exists you can see that a and beta should become constants. So in which case a prime and b prime must be equal to 0. So the condition for steady state is uh, that uh, these, uh, these are 0, these are nothing but fixed points of these two differential equations. So corresponding to each fixed point of the equation for amplitude and phase there is one steady state possible and this again turns out to be multiple valued and how do we study stability here? What we do is we study the stability of the fixed points that also we have discussed earlier. So in these two approaches uh, in the first approach we are using Floquet's theory and the system that we are studying is a system with time varying coefficients whereas here in the next approach we get the steady state as fixed points of certain simplified uh, set of differential equations and we investigate the uh, stability of the solution by studying the stability of the fixed points. Now, See, this gives um, you a kind of a brief overview of, of what are the qualitative features that you could expect in a typical nonlinear system. This is just a tip of an iceberg, there are many more complicating issues, but uh, given that you have an understanding of linear system behavior, uh, this, is, this is a uh, list of items that you should start thinking about. Now, why nonlinear analysis is important? There are many reasons, although many engineering systems are designed to behave linearly. Uh, one might think that nonlinearity is not that important in engineering design, but that is not uh, factually correct. For example, in earthquake engineering, we design the structures to be uh, to display controlled inelastic response. Uh, there are certain preferred modes of failures and certain failure modes that are not preferred. That means we design the structure to fail in a particular mode. For example, uh, we want to have strong columns and uh, weak beams. That means if a multi-story building is going to fail under an earthquake, the failure should begin with failure of beams uh, that is slabs and things like that and not for example the ground floor column. If a ground floor column fails, no matter how strong the structure is, the whole structure will collapse. Then similarly for industrial structures like uh, uh, piping systems and things like that, uh, we use certain supporting devices known as snubbers uh, and uh, nonlinear energy dissipation devices and things like that. Uh, these again in, uh, you know impart nonlinearity to the system. For example, a heat exchanger pipe in a nuclear reactor conveys fluid at hot temperature. So in the normal uh, course of its operation, it should be able to withstand the thermal loads because of the conveyance of hot fluids. But in the event of an earthquake, uh, there will be additional support motions. To cope up with thermal loads, the structure needs to be flexible, but that very flexibility brings the natural frequency of the system into the Mm, uh, range of earthquake uh, excitation frequencies. So supports like snubbers uh, in the event of an earthquake they, they lock the structure and reduce the spans of the piping and increase the natural frequency so that it attracts lesser seismic loads. Similarly in wind engineering uh, the interaction between structures and uh, uh, the flow past uh, vibrating structures induces uh, highly nonlinear. Uh, forcing functions that I will just briefly mention in the next uh, one of the next slides. Materials like concrete and soil 
which are uh, important in civil engineering application display nonlinear behavior even at low strengths. So the response need not be very large before nonlinearity is switched on. Uh, they also they uh, display differing behavior in tension and compression. Then response depends upon entire time history, duration over which the load is applied and ambient effects such as temperature. Next, uh, if a structure is cracked and it starts vibrating, the closing and opening of cracks induces certain type of nonlinearities that we have to think of. And if you, if, as structure engineers, we are always interested in study of failures because we want to design structures to prevent failures. So, to understand failures, we have to enter uh, nonlinear regimes of responses. A linear system, in principle, can never fail. Uh, you know, it can withstand infinite stresses. There could be problems of loss of stability. This we have discussed, like buckling and snap through, and so on and so forth. In many application, modern application, prototype testing using nonlinear FE models have become uh, popular. For example, crash analysis in automotive design, simulation of draft test in electronic industry, etc. Instead of performing costly experimental uh, studies, um, cheaper finite element simulations are being used. The sources of uh, nonlinearity in uh, structural mechanics problems can originate from nonlinear strain displacement relations. This type of nonlinearity is called geometric nonlinearity, or the relation, the constitutive relations, typically relating stress and strain. It could be temperature as well, could be nonlinear. Then nonlinearity associated with boundary conditions, as in contact uh, related problems and so on and so forth. And similarly, nonlinear energy dissipation mechanisms. Uh, these are some sources of nonlinearity. So, a structure can behave in different ways. For example, the material of the structure could be nonlinear, but there could be small displacements. So, the uh, typical force response diagram may look like this. So, the deformations are not large, but the material of the structure has already entered a nonlinear regime. So, it is nonlinearity in constitutive relations. In the other type of behavior, material may be linear or nonlinear, but large rotations will occur and there are small deformations. So, there are small strains, but large rotations. Now, of course, one can have uh, large rotations as well as large strains. So, these are the most uh, difficult problems to deal with. There could be special conditions like, for example, the same structure is supported through a gap and a loaded sp spring like this. So, this, till the time this gap is negotiated, the spring will not come into action. And moment that happens, the, there will be a, a bilinear nonlinearity. And this type of uh, boundary conditions uh, create what are known as nonlinear boundary conditions. If you write the equation of motion uh, for a simple case again, uh, say mx double dot plus cx plus a nonlinear term, the, the function g is a function of instantaneous value of displacement and velocity. This is inelastic. Uh, this is nonlinearly elastic system. That means upon unloading, uh, this force would go to zero and uh, there will not be any residual displacement. The loading and unloading path will be tracing each other. On the other hand, there could be forces of uh, nonlinear non forces which are dependent on entire history of the response up to the current time. So, this is this typically originates from material nonlinearity and this originates from geometric nonlinearity. Uh, so, a typical force displacement uh, syst uh, you know graph for a um, uh, system exhibiting so called hereditary nonlinear behavior or hysteretic nonlinear behavior is shown here. So, this is something like a force and a displacement and for a given value of displacement you can see that there are multiple forces possible. Which one will be realized depends on how you have reached that point. That means, it depends on the history of the response up to that time. So, this type of systems are more difficult to analyze as you could expect than this model. If these are difficult to model as well as to more difficult to analyze. Now, uh, there are nonlinear effects in I mentioned about wind engineering problems. So, uh, if you imagine that there is a uh, chimney uh, which is subjected to say a flow, this is planar view, the chimney is something like this, and the flow is taking place like this. The flow past uh, this um, uh, chimney will create a pressure field on the object, and if you integrate the pressure field over the surface area, you get a force which can be resolved in line and uh, across uh, the flow directions and uh, we can show that uh, for certain flow velocities and certain geometries there will be vertices that will be shed and because of that there will be uh, 
um, dynamic excitations predominantly harmonic uh, uh, on these chimneys and these are known as across wind oscillations. So, th and if the chimney is flexible, the nature of these excitations become fairly complicated. So, flow past a flexible object uh, can create uh, severe uh, interaction, uh, fluid structure interaction and for that type of systems, there will be a special type of nonlinearity as shown here. I discussed this when we discussed limit cycle oscillations in the one of the earlier lectures. You can see here that uh, for small x dot, the term inside the parenthesis will be less than 1 and uh, the net effect of this term will be negative. It is like a negatively damped system and small oscillations tend to grow. For large amplitude oscillations, the term here becomes negative and induces a positive sign on this and large amplitudes tend to decay. So, in free vibration, the system displays what is known as a limit cycle behavior. So, and uh, that is a periodic solution. Uh, it is an isolated periodic solution and when such systems are driven by external excitations, there can be complex interactions between the periodic solutions which are highly uh, nonlinear periodic solutions in uh, free vibration and the components due to external excitation and there are very, uh, very many complex behavior well, one, well, something known as entrainment and things like that. These are uh, again characterizes nonlinear resonances and if you want to understand the peak response in such systems, you have to understand the basic entrainment uh, phenomena. Now, so with this brief uh, background, we will come to the objectives of uh, the discussion on nonlinear uh, systems. So, the idea here is the subject is very vast, uh, it cannot be covered in few lectures that uh, I am planning to uh, uh, you know dedicate to this topic. The idea here is to provide a brief uh, uh, review of background concepts and present a flavor of treatment of nonlinear structural mechanics problems using finite element method. The focus is on geometric, uh, geometrically nonlinear problems. We will not be talking about uh, material nonlinearity, by and large, we will be focusing on geometrically nonlinear problems. We can begin with uh, whatever background we have without uh, uh, asking too many uh, newer questions. For example, if you are talking about a planar Euler Bernoulli beam, if we assume that there are large transverse displacement but small strains and there are moderate rotations, then the changes in geometry due to deformation uh, need not be accounted for while defining stress. So, the point here is if a structure undergoes large amplitude oscillations, the geomet geometry of the structure also would change. So, that needs to be taken into account while defining stress. So, that uh, modifies many of the basic formulations that we will use for analyzing this system. But suppose we do not get into that, under these conditions probably one can overlook those complications, then we will be able to proceed with whatever background we have. For example, uh, if we assume the um, invoke the Euler Bernoulli hypothesis that upon deformation the line segment Mn uh, remains straight and normal to the neutral axis and its length does not change. Uh, we as we get the, the displacement field. This we have discussed uh, a few times, uh, the, uh, where u1, u2, u3 are displacement along x, y, z respectively, and u0 of x and w0 of x are the displacement of the point on neutral axis. The strain displacement relations uh, that we will be using are nonlinear. We are not using the infinitesimal definition of the strain, we are including the nonlinear terms as well. This I have discussed, the definitions I have discussed in one of the previous lectures. So, the nonlinear strain displacement relations are again displayed here. The quantities that appear in the red are the nonlinear terms. So, for this assumed displacement field, uh, I get epsilon 1 1, uh, I will retain the first term um, dou u 1 by dou x 1, but this quadratic term we are not including uh, because we assume strains are uh, small, but dou u 3 by dou x 1 is a rotation that is included. So, I get this. Uh, my term for epsilon 1 1. That means dou u 1 by dou x 1 whole square is ignored, but dou u 3 by dou x 1 is retained. Now, uh, only this strain will be non zero, all other strains will be uh, zero. And uh, uh, stress again, I assume isotropic uh, elastic material. So, stress is related to strain through this relation. I will be able to write the expression for strain energy and the kinetic energy uh, using the assumed uh, you know form of displacement and the consequent strains and I get strain energy in this form uh, and uh, if I now use uh, the assumed displacement form, 
I get this you see now there are quartic terms in displacement uh, in the expression for um, strain energy. So, the terms appearing in red are the newer terms uh, now if we assume uh, uh, the beam to possess symmetric cross section uh, the terms appearing in red uh, are not the uh, I mean it does not connote uh, nonlinear terms but the terms which will go to 0 if you assume uh, beam cross section to be symmetric. So, if that happens these two terms will go to 0 and I am left with u which is this and the second set of terms are the new terms due to presence of nonlinearity. Kinetic energy is given by this I can write the Lagrangian and uh, again I will take a two noded element with 3 degrees of freedom per node and uh, we will again interpolate uh, the axial displacement using linear interpolation functions and transverse displacement using Hermite polynomials. Uh, I get uh, this set of equations and if I run through the Lagrange equation I will get um, the required equations of motion. So, if you examine the Lagrangian uh, the first few terms were already encountered when you did a linear analysis. So, they lead to typical uh, mass and uh, stiffness matrices that we have already derived and the newer terms will originate from these two nonlinear terms. So, suppose if you will focus on one of this suppose the first term 1 by 8 a e dou w by dou x for d x and substitute for the um, assumed displacement form uh, I get this and when we run the Lagrangian on this we will get cubic terms here huh? and this i i i j m k is a new integral that has to be determined. So, here we will not get matrices we will get vectors. So, uh, similarly the other term uh, uh, involving uh, uh, the other nonlinear term which is this if we do that again we get newer nonlinear term which could be quadratic or cubic. So, uh, I, I again name some of the integrals that appear here through the notation k i r s k etcetera. So, the final form of equation of motion at the element level will be m e u e double dot plus k e u e plus vector of quadratic and cubic terms in u of t ok. And the, the multipliers that appear here are properties of the structural system ok. So, uh, this is the equation. So, in free vibration this will be 0. Now, energies in different elements can be added. So, Lagrangian can be constructed for the built up structure using uh, the approach that we have used there is no change in that, uh, that aspect of our work. So, assembly of element level matrices and vector can be done as before to obtain global equations of motion. Then derivation of external forces and imposition of boundary conditions again follows the earlier uh, developed procedure there is nothing new there. The resulting equation of motion for the structure after imposing boundary conditions and after computing the external forces will be of this form in this case. So, this g of u is the uh, nonlinear term uh, that is arising in this model and this will as we have seen it will have cubic and quadratic terms in u. Now, we have already discussed how to uh, solve this equation see for example, we uh, during earlier lecture lecture number 16 we have developed a uh, you know operator splitting methods and other methods to tackle these equations. Uh, so, that can be used I am not going to discuss the solution procedures at this juncture again. Similar analysis can be done for Timoshenko beam I, this I leave as an exercise. So, this is the assumed displacement field and this will be the strain and uh, there will be one more strain which is epsilon 1 3 and uh, you will have to use this expression and construct the Lagrangian. Now, you have to include kinetic energy due to translation and uh, the rotation the rotary inertial effect also has to be included here. So, once you do that following a similar procedure you will be able to derive uh, the equation for Timoshenko beam. Now, this is all right, but uh, how about a more general theory. Now, in a more general theory we need to allow for uh, measures of strain and stresses to be defined consistent with the deformations and also we need to allow for material nonlinear. This we will not be doing, but this we will discuss now as a uh, as a structure undergoes large deformation uh, the cross sectional properties might change. So, when we define stress uh, we will have questions on uh, uh, some kind of a force divided by an area which area are you talking about is it the structure in its undeformed configuration or in the deformed configuration. 
if you say it, uh, the area is to be computed based on deformed configuration, when you are defining stress, you would not know what the deformed configuration is, right? So, and then similarly, when you define strains, you have to think about large rotations. I will show uh, either during this lecture or the next lecture that if you use in the infinitesimal definition for strains, uh, a structure undergoing rigid rotation, the strains won't be zero. So that is not acceptable. So uh, say you can't stick with infinitesimal strain definition. That also needs to be modified. So some of these issues need to be addressed. And to do all this systematically, we need to uh, get into the subject of continuum mechanics and uh, develop all the language and the notations in a systematic way before we even we can address a, a simple uh, class of problems. There, this subject is very vast. As I already said, we are not going to discuss uh, many aspects of this. Will not be discussed. I have given a list of references which cover um, this subject in uh, good detail, and I will be using some of these references during the lecture. Now. Um, the subject of nonlinear analysis of structures uh, is uh, mathematically a lot more refined than a linear analysis. Uh, there are many issues associated with uh, notations and uh, the, as I already said definition of stress strain and the balance uh, laws. The all, all of them we need to revisit. So th there are issues about notations. There are four sets of notations that uh, one has to use. Uh, one has to understand to understand literature on this subject. Uh, the indicial notations, I will quickly review this. Uh, a set of variables x1 to x1, x2, xn is simply denoted as xi. That means the indicial the, uh, here in the name refers to the index to the variables that we assign. The range of values taken by the index i needs to be specified. Typically, i runs from 1 to 3 uh, if they are in a Cartesian space, but it need not be so. Now, repeated indices imply summation. For example, uh, if I have a term like alpha equal to i equal to 1 to n a i x i, this is simply written as alpha a i x i and i, I have to specify what range it has to be used, i is 1 to n. Um, see this i is a dummy index. Instead of writing a i x i as well, I can write a s x s. So that i or s is not very important, it is a dummy index. Similarly, a, a term like this. Uh, is written as half k i j u i o j. You can see that i and j are repeated, therefore a summation on i and j are implied from i equal to 1 to n. This Kronecker delta is a symbol that is used. Delta i j is 1 if i equal to j, otherwise it is 0. So using that, uh, for example, the length of an infinitesimal element ds square, uh, which is given by dx1 square plus dx2 square plus dx square is written as delta i j dx i dx j. There is a symbol known as permutation symbol epsilon i j k. It is uh, defined as shown here. So you can keep this figure in mind. If you run from 1, 2, 3 or 2, 3, 1 or 3, 1, 2, epsilon i j k is 1. On the other hand, you run in the other way 1, 3, 2, 3, 2, 1 or 2, 1, 3, it is minus 1. For all other combinations, it is 0. Now, if A is a 3 by 3 matrix, the determinant of A can be written using the permutation symbol in this way. Uh, there is a small exercise, there is an identity known as epsilon delta identity. Uh, you can show that epsilon ijk and Kronecker delta are related through this uh, identity. Now there is a symbol for differentiation. Suppose if you consider a function which is f of x1, x2 up to xn and if df is what I am looking at, uh, it is given by this. This is written compactly as df equal to dou f by dou xi into dxi. The index i repeats and it has to be summed over 1 to n. And this comma symbol, that is a differentiation symbol. If I again have this function f1, f2, f3 to be functions of x1, x2, x3, if I write f of i, j, it is dou fy by dou xj. Similarly, uh, sigma ij, k is delta of sigma ij by dou xk. This comma k means you have to differentiate with respect to the kth variable. So this is like a mathematical shorthand for uh, writing the long expressions. Physics will get buried inside these notations. So it is not very convenient if you are understanding the subject for the first time, but it is very useful in compactly expressing the results. The algebraic notations, um, 
Suppose I have a vector with components x1, x2, x3 and uh, y, y1, y2, y3. x dot y is x1, y1 plus x2, y2 plus x3, y3 and x cross y is given by this and uh, this is written as zi is epsilon ijk xj yk. Then grad that is this, in, uh, this delta inverted delta uh, uh, is uh, this operation e1 dou by dou x1 plus e2 dou by dou x2 plus this it is written ei dou xi. Now this is a scalar function if you take a grad of a scalar function it is given by dou f by dou xi that by ith component is this. Now if you apply the grad operation on a vector valued function f uh, we can define what is our divergence which is del dot f uh, which is given by this uh, this is a dot symbol the curl is delta cross f and that is given by uh, this. Now if you apply a grad function on a vector valued function uh, it is written on delta comma f uh, this is given by this and f uh, itself is a vector therefore I have to write this. So you can see that grad of a vector valued function will have uh, these uh, gradients present in, uh, in their representation. In matrix notations uh, we arrange the components of a vector in a, a, a column like this and even stress is arranged as a column like this right. So stress is a uh, tensor uh, three, uh, represented a 3 by 3 matrix but in this so called white uh, notations uh, we write it as 6 cross 1 uh, vector similarly strain. So the strain energy is written as half sigma transpose epsilon. So we represent the terms like this for example R square is written as X transpose X and so on and so on. So when doing this we do not write explicitly the connective symbol for example when I say uh, x transpose x I am not putting in between any dot or a multiplication or a, a any other symbol. In tensor notations indices are not shown uh, this is applicable to Cartesian and other coordinate systems xi yi that means it is a summation of uh, is x1 y1 plus x2 y2 plus x2 is simply written x dot y a i j b i j is written as a double dot b this is a new symbol that we will use colon denotes contraction of pair of repeated indices whereas a dot denotes a single dot denotes uh, contraction of inner indices whereas this double dot uh, denotes contraction of pair of repeated indices. So this relation sigma ij c ij kl epsilon kl is a uh, in uh, tensor notation is written as c uh, double dot epsilon. So I have given some examples of writing different expressions in alternative uh, notations uh, this you can uh, examine. So if we have uh, something like phi transpose k phi in tensor notation it is written as phi dot k dot phi in indicial it is phi i k i j phi j. Similarly you have half epsilon transpose c epsilon this is written as half epsilon double dot c double dot epsilon whereas this epsilon i c i j epsilon j so, so on and so forth. This and the equilibrium equations for elasticity uh, is uh, in the long hand in full notation form it is given by this in matrix form it is given by this in indicial it is given by this. Actually the full notation is a notation of last resort uh, where everything is spelt out without cutting down uh, any uh, you know uh, you write all the terms and uh, this clearly becomes cumbersome if you have to deal with uh, this type of equations too often. Now, I will start now a quick review of continuum mechanics there is what is known as continuum hypothesis. So according to this uh, hypothesis material is infinitely divisible and each infinitesimal element retains all the properties of the material so that Newtonian mechanics is directly applicable that means calculus works that means concept of elementary strip and uh, things like that work and we can derive the governing physical laws can be expressed as partial differential equations or, or, or as ordinary differential equations or through variational arguments. Now obviously we know matter is not infinitely divisible uh, it breaks down to elementary particles if we do that but that we are ignoring in this hypothesis. So consequently we need to focus our attention to uh, characteristic dimensions which is about uh, greater than about 10 to the power of minus 6 centimeter. So if you are dealing with dimensions less than this then uh, continuum hypothesis needs to be uh, I mean you can uh, you have to uh, look at other possible effects that are present in the physics of the problem. Uh, just to uh, give in this context diameter of a water molecule is about uh, 10 to the power of minus 8 centimeter. So if you are dealing with fluid mechanics problem 
uh, in which the medium is water, uh, the fluid is water, then you cannot think of sizes less than 10 to the power of minus 6 uh, characteristic lengths less than this. The, the continuum mechanics uh, theory is valid for both solids and fluids, it does not distinguish between the two and uh, due to the assumption of uh, existence of continuum, notions of density, temperature, pressure at a point make sense. The primary aim is to model macroscopic behavior of solids and fluids. So uh, just to emphasize again, it ignores the atomic structure of the matter uh, and, and also matter consists of discrete particles which are per perpetually in motion, even this motion is not included in our analysis. Then questions on treatment of molecular, grain or crystal structure are not addressed in continuum mechanics. There are different themes in continuum mechanics. Uh, we talk about kinematics where we talk about motion and deformation, kinetics uh, where we talk about uh, concept of stress and there are different balance laws which basically enunciate certain physical laws, I will come to the, some of them uh, which are common to both fluids and uh, solids. In the context of nonlinear uh, structural mechanics problem, what is crucial to gain a, a reasonable understanding of the subject is to understand how rotations are dealt with. Rotations are very crucial in uh, problems of nonlinear analysis. And what are the uh, uh, what is the need for defining alternatively? Uh, what is the need for alternative definitions for stresses and strains? And then how to treat material nonlinearly? So we'll start uh, uh, some simple questions about kinematics. Kinematics is study of motion and deformation without concerning with causes of motion and deformation. We do not talk about forces which create the motion uh, and deformation, we simply uh, focus on geometry. So here we talk about uh, a reference configuration, say let us assume body B at time uh, 0. Uh, th th this omega naught is a domain, gamma naught is a boundary and we consider a Cartesian coordinate system. So capital X1, X2, X3 uh, is for body at time t equal to 0. Now during the process of deformation, uh, every point here, the width position vector OP which is X gets mapped to another point P whose position vector is X. This X is related to uh, capital X through this relation. So this is a mapping of the deformation. The reference frame the origin is at 0 and there is an orthonormal, orthonormal basis E1, E2, E3, this is a coordinate system. The body B occupies different regions omega naught, omega 1, etc., omega at times t equal to 0, 1, 2, t1, t2, t3 and t. The regions omega naught, omega 1, etc., omega occupied the body at different time instants are known as configurations of the body at the respective time instance. At time t equal to 0, we say that omega naught is the initial state of the body or the initial configuration. It could also be taken as reference configuration with respect to which motion is described. There are other names like uh, it, is a, it is taken to be undeformed configuration. It is an idealization, nobody is truly undeformed because the gravity and things like that always act on them. So what you see as a reference configuration is already deformed due to some one or the other uh, effects. Now gamma naught is a boundary of the initial configuration. At time t, this is the current state of the body, the current deformed configuration. Gamma, uh, uh, gamma is the boundary of the current configuration. So this is uh, gamma 1. There are two uh, coordinate systems that we can think of using to describe the problem. One is known as Eulerian, other, the other one is Lagrangian. In Lagrangian description, we take x1, capital X1, x2, x3, comma t as independent variables. That means the point P is described by its position in the initial configuration. That is capital X1, x2, x3. The, those uh, x1, x2, x3 are taken as independent variables. In Eulerian description, we take the lower case x1, x2, x3 as independent variables. Now x is written position vector x is written as xi, ei which is nothing but x1, e1 plus x2, e2 plus x3, e3. So this is a position vector of a material point in the initial configuration. This does not change with time because initial configuration is some reference position that does not change with time. It labels all material points. Whereas x, the lowercase x, which is again xi ei, this provides the position of a point in the con current configuration. Changes as configurations evolve in time. In problems of solid mechanics, we adopt Lagrangian descriptions. Uh, the Lagrangian description is also known as material description. 
and the Eulerian description is also known as spatial description. The motion itself that is this function phi of x t is defined the motion that is a coordinate in the uh, current configuration uh, a point in the current configuration that is a position vector of a point in the current configuration is related to where the point was in the reference configuration through this function. So this is in long hand it is there are three functions x1, x2, x3 uh, phi1, phi2, phi3 that relate the capital x1, x2, x3 to the lower case x1 and x2 and x3. When reference and initial configurations coincide uh, at t equal to 0 x of x comma 0 is capital X. So that would mean which is phi of x comma 0. So then xi of xi x comma 0 this is the definition which is phi i of x comma 0 and this is an identity transformation. So in material coordinates displacement is given by x minus capital X which is nothing but phi of x comma t minus phi of x comma 0 or phi of x comma t minus capital X. Velocity is its time gradient capital X does not change with time therefore the gradient is simply uh, du by dt as shown here. There is no dou u by dou x term uh, which gets multiplied by dou x by dou t that is not there because capital uh, dou of capital X by dou t is 0. So similarly acceleration also can be defined. On the other hand in the spatial coordinates if you want to define the gradient of a, uh, of a vector say function say phi of x comma t this is dou phi by dou t plus dou phi by dou xj and dxj by dt. So this is there will be a new term. So acceleration gets defined like this and uh, this is a definition of acceleration if you are looking at spatial coordinates. Now a primary quantity of interest in um, discussing deformation is what is known as deformation gradient. So the problem is uh, the, the question is the issue is this this is a configuration of the body at time t equal to 0 and pq is a line segment. Upon deformation capital P goes to small p and capital Q goes to capital Q and this line segment dx gets mapped to this lowercase dx. The question is how this dx is related to this capital dx and that will be through a matrix known as deformation gradient. So we will take up this discussion on deformation gradient and follow up this uh, topic in the next lecture. So we will close this lecture at this point.